this week's edition of You in Africa, I'm going to be talking to you about migration, specifically migration towards uh, Europe from the African continent, but also from the Middle East. And the question we're trying to respond to today is, is migration a thriving business? focusing quite specifically on research that the ISS in partnership with the Global in uh, Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime conducted into smuggling from North Africa, from the Horn of Africa, as well as from Syria in 2015. This is research that will be ongoing, but before we start, the one thing that we need to make clear is while there are people who are using smugglers to cross borders into Europe, these are not by any measure the majority of, uh, of immigrants into Europe. However, that does not mean that responding to smuggling should be something that is at the bottom of people's lists. The reality is a lot of people, and at least for 2015, over 5,000 people died as a result of trying to cross over the Mediterranean from North Africa, because while smuggling is good business to some, it's also dangerous business. And speaking quite specifically to the evolving story around migration, some of the issues that have, that have happened over the past, at least the past three years, we've seen a spike in migration from 2013 towards 2015, with 2015 seeing the most, uh, the highest increase over the past three years. Most notably, countries like Libya and North Africa have become gateways into Europe. At the same time, the Aegean crossing in Greece has also served to allow immigrants to cross over from the Western, from Eastern Europe, from parts of Syria, as well as from North Africa into Europe. Serious war, which continues to rage on, has also led to the result or an influx of migrants coming not only from Syria, but also from people within the Middle Eastern region who seek to migrate to Europe or to other parts of the world. At the same time, migration, which has always occurred on the African continent, but also more generally, which has always occurred in Europe, in East Asia, and parts of the rest of the world, continues. So what we do have at the moment is the rise in migration, which comes from countries currently afflicted by serious governance problems, serious uh, conflict, as well as the rise in extremism. But at the same time, we've got secondary migration, economic migrants, people who are moving from their countries simply seeking a better life, not necessarily in Europe, but a, a, an overwhelming majority of them are finding their way into Western Europe. And the reality is, of these people, the people who find themselves seeking the assistance of smugglers are in many ways the most vulnerable. It is those people who feel that they have no option but to seek the assistance of someone like a smuggler who will at the very least assure them that they can get across. This is the case that we have seen from countries currently ravaged by conflict in North Africa, as well as parts of the Horn of Africa, and again in Syria and the Middle East, where people instead of simply trying to cross the border legally, they see no option but to use an illegal path because the barriers are high, the regulations are also there, and even though, particularly in Western Europe, the Dublin regulation does allow at least for landing refugees to be registered, the question isn't that all of these people are refugees, some of them are simply seeking a better life. But speaking quite specifically to what smugglers do and how they operate, the first and very important thing to note about smugglers is that it's simply a niche business trying to respond to the needs of people who are trying to move across borders. And so what smugglers serve as is facilitators. Um, the stereotypical smuggler simply, uh, simply facilitates movement across borders, but the broader the business of smuggling um, is, the more a smuggler engages with different facets of the smuggling business. So you find, for example, smugglers who help immigrants in terms of better understanding the countries that they're going to. So they help them in uh, acclimatizing them to the socio-cultural demands of those countries. Some of them also help them in terms of how to better understand social grant systems, ways in which to live in those spaces. Other smugglers also facilitate a welcoming party or people in the landing country who will be able to serve as the host for the migrants. So they're not just cloaked at night and trying to cross to, to ensure people cross the borders. They're also trying to ensure that once people cross the borders, they do not come back.
The reality, though, is not all smuggling is created equal. For some, they have to cross the Mediterranean, they have to cross across the Aegean using uh, rubber dinghies, which are not always very safe, and as a result, people die across the borders. Others who can afford a better way to cross the borders pay more to be able to go onto more sturdy boats and more um, safer routes than the others that um, cannot simply cannot afford those routes. And so there are really two um, major typologies of smuggling. The first is a pay as you go. You pay, you get exactly what you pay for, you cross the border. Uh, with some smugglers, what they will do is they will also give you a, a mobile device to allow you to be able to communicate with them on your way. At the same time, they will offer transportation, be it across land borders or across sea borders. But once you've paid and once you're on your boat, that's pretty much the service that they offer. The second package, the more expensive package, is the full package. This package includes a whole range of services, including the cultural acclimatization, including advice on how best to deal with, with relocating and moving to a country which is not familiar to the migrant. At the same time, they also allow them to have a network, a social network, in which they can be able to engage and communicate with fellow migrants, but also with people within the network. The full package undoubtedly costs way more than the pay-as-you-go package. The majority of migrants will pick the pay-as-you-go because it's cheaper, it's quicker. The full package, not as cheap, sometimes not as quick, but definitely safer. And so first, in terms of formulating policies to respond to migration, it's very important, be it here on the African continent, the AU, African countries, as well as on the European continent and in the Middle East, to first understand the problem. It's one thing to say that there's a rise in migration and that needs to be addressed. But it's also another thing altogether to be able to say, why are people moving? Why this rise in migration? And once you're able to answer that, and also to, to be able to say, how are people moving? Which routes are they taking? And why are they choosing those specific routes? So first, answer those questions. And once you've answered those questions, the way in which you formulate policies responds to those questions. But what we do know so far in terms of the research that the ISS, together with the Global Initiative, has conducted is that smuggling is high profit and low risk. Low risk, not for the migrant, but low risk for the smuggler themselves. All they do is facilitate movement. All they do is facilitate, perhaps, a step towards a better life. But at the same time, criminality has rised as a result of the raised barriers. People find it more difficult to be able to cross over into countries if the visa regulations are tougher. But that doesn't mean the people won't want to still cross over. So what that means now is people will resort to criminal means in order to be able to cross the borders. Smugglers are very good at trading and misinformation. The one thing that they want is reliance, is for people to rely on them. And so what they will say is there's no better option than to be smuggled over the border. A lot of the people that are being smuggling, that are being smuggled, can afford to cross the border legally. But they are informed through their networks, as well as through people facilitating movement, that the better option for them is to pay for it. At the same time, the majority of financial transactions are in the informal economy. This is very much linked to the criminal, to the criminal aspect. The next is that smugglers are highly responsive to state policies. What smugglers do is actually look at what is happening on the continent. A better, the best example is last year, Germany, for a period of about three months, suspended the Dublin regulations. In suspending the Dublin regulations, it allowed for people, uh, particularly people coming from Syria, not to require pre-registration before they entered into, into Germany. The result was a spike in migration during that time period. As soon as Germany ended its suspension of the Dublin regulations, migration has slowed down. The reality, though, is migrants, as well as smugglers, also tune into the news. 
they know what is happening. They know what policymakers are saying about their movement. And so for the most part, smugglers will try to better tune themselves to what is happening both in Africa as well as in Europe. And more importantly, in, in regions like Syria where people are escaping conflict. And moving quite specifically to Syrian migrants, Syrian migrants have, in terms of the research that we've done, been seen to have a higher bargaining power in part because they are being received in the countries that they're going to, but also because they do have more disposable income than the range of um, other mi African migrants that are trying to cross over. A range of Syrian migrants have different options in terms of how to cross over into Europe. Some go north, others move southwards into Sudan, onto Egypt, and then across the Mediterranean. The options vary. But the reality is, for them, it would seem that their only option is to flee. So in formulating solutions around that, it is to recognize that once you solve the problem in the source country, you won't have as big a problem in terms of people seeking to leave it. And so there are issues around governance, issues around responding to an increase in violent extremism in those particular countries, but also more generally in the region. The last point that policymakers need to understand before they respond is that there is an increase in communication as well as access to information. This is a point that cannot be overstressed. The reality is, once again, the more people know, the more people are able to shape the way in which they engage. With that, and moving on, before we move on to the question and answer segment, I will direct you to more information which you can get from our recent paper entitled Survive and Advance, the Economics of Smuggling Migrants and um, Refugees and Migrants into Europe, written by Tuesday Reitano and Peter Tinti from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, funded generously by the Hans Seidel Foundation. Um, yes, there are follow on plans to do more research but starting in 2016. The research that we are going to do in 2016 focuses on two main issues. The first is around doing smuggler surveys and looking into why they're motivated into smuggling. This research will not only focus to uh, the middlemen, as it were, but also other people that are involved in the process. What we have found, for example, in Egypt is that people, hotel owners, taxi drivers are part of the business, not as smugglers themselves, but as people who feed into that. So the research that we will be doing in 2016 will be to respond to that and to see how smugglers are, are actually dealing with the mi migrant issue, but also quite importantly, to, to get more answers in terms of the cost of smuggling. Um, the second batch of the research will focus quite specifically on the increase of migration from North Africa. So what we're going to be doing is doing um, field research focusing quite specifically on Libya, as well as Egypt and um, other countries in North Africa, including Morocco, uh, and Tunisia to see why there has been a, an, a sharp increase as well in terms of migrants coming from, from North Africa. At the end of 2015, um, the African Union, together with uh, some representatives of African countries, joined the European Union and its delegates in Valletta and Malta to discuss this issue. From the African Union's point of view, migration is nothing new. In terms of how they're seeking to address it, at the very least on a policy level, they are trying to align themselves with the EU policy on migration. But at the same time, their particular gripe is that barriers are increasingly higher and harder for African migrants to cross. What the African Union is calling on is more access, more open movement, um, but at the same time, when it comes, this is on a policy level. At an implementation level, for example, in 2016, is one of the, the themes of the AU for 2016 relates to movement. But in terms of actual implementation of this, that's the challenge we have, because while encouraging open movement outside of Africa, the reality is there is very little in terms of free movement on the African continent. And this is something that the African Union should be leading on. Um, specifically to people who are crossing over um, 
across the Mediterranean, for example, it can become a maritime security issue. Um, as we saw with the way in which Italy responded to, to, to migration across the Mediterranean, um, uh, an initiative that they have now stopped, for them it really was about securing their borders, securing their, their sea borders, but at the same time also seeking a way to ensure that uh, there are as little or as minimum debts as possible. So in many ways, particularly for people crossing over from North Africa, as well as people who are seeking to cross over through the Asian crossing as well, um, it does become a maritime security issue. But to date, the countries that have recognized this as a maritime security issue are, for the most part, uh, those on the European side of the border, Italy as an example, um, who, who have sought to securitize their, their maritime um, entry points. And at the same time, also on the African continent, Egypt has recognized this as a maritime security issue. Thank you all for your attention and for those of you who were unable to, to catch the audio during the start of the presentation, please do remember to log on to our YouTube channel, ISS Africa TV, where you'll be able to, to access um, this view on Africa as well as other videos that the ISS has produced. And again, thank you very much.